I'd like to call the meeting of the Urbana City Council to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Ammons? Here. Mr. Brown? Here. Mr. Jacobson? Here. Mr. Madigan? Here. Ms. Marlin? Here. Mr. Roberts? Here. Mr. Smythe? Here. Mayor Pressing? Here. Um, the first item is the approval of the minutes. I was of saying here. Aaron. March 20th, 2017. Was that a motion, Aaron? No. Okay. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve the minutes? Motion by Smythe. Second. Seconded by Jacobson. Any additions or corrections? Bill Brown. Um, on page three, item F, F, yeah, F1C. Uh, the disposition was six I and zero nay, but it lists Aaron Ammons is voting nay. I think it was all I's, but I'm not sure. Oh. You see it? Well, the vote. yeah, I see it. Well, this is um, this is uh, recorded, so we could check it, okay? Madam Clerk, the top of um, page three, it has Ammons voting nay and everybody else voting aye, and then it says seven ayes and zero nays. Yeah. Oh, yeah, actually that wasn't the one I saw, but the one below that is just like that. Oh, they're, they're both the same? There's another one that has an A, and then all the rest of them eyes. Oh, well, okay. So B and okay, C, Okay, B yeah. and C, okay. Well, we'll check it out and see. All right, we'll fix it. Anything else? Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. Um, are there any additions to the agenda? Don't see any. Petitions and communications, I have two. Uh, Will Martins, heel to toe. Yeah, you can come we up. don't have it on the agenda, but you can talk about whatever you like, whether it's on the agenda or not. Um, I was talking with uh, Dennis Roberts. He came in the store to talk about the uh, planned renovation or possible renovation of the hotel. Um, did a little research into Hilton, and I'm sure some of you are aware that that's a pretty good sized chain. and three of the top eight hotel chains in this country are run by Hilton. Um, the thing that, uh, and I know that this is a large chunk of change and I know there's some people very opposed to it, but that hotel has sat rather empty for a very long period of time. And usually capital expenditures on th something like that hotel is usually done at about seven to eight years, so that building is way overdue. Now the city council or the city has given about what a million and a half or more to have the roof and some other things repaired on it. It was re re returned to us. It was returned to you. Yeah. Okay. So there are things that have been done. Right. And improvements and structurally, I think the building is in pretty good shape. And there are uh, mechanicals that need to be done, but structurally tearing it down to me just doesn't make any sense at all. We have taken old buildings in downtown. I've invested something like over three million dollars. That's not chump change and neither is doing the, this hotel but it's a lot bigger project and I know that nine million dollars in bonds is a substantial amount but uh, according to what I found online about Hilton and their small business association loans, if they are using them, they've never failed. So they've got a good success rate. And I know from what I heard from Dennis that most of all of us in the downtown would like to keep that hotel. Now, about a year ago, I had one supplier who wanted me to do a renovation on one store, on a name store. And 
the stuff that they wanted to put in it, I would call it making us a CVS pharmacy. It looked like every other CVS pharmacy in this country, and I'm not picking on them. But box stores, uh, all the box malls and things like that, people are sick and tired of it. And that's why they're sitting online and ordering, because there's no new experience. I got a feeling, you know, if you go online and you look for the tapestry hotels for Hilton, they've got an example of one. It is absolutely stunning. It's great. And to take that hotel and do what I think they're probably going to do to it, it's still going to be a new building, but it's not going to be a box building. And again, you're right next to one of the oldest malls in the United States. Is anybody going to want to tear that hotel down and stick something next to that? No, I think what would happen is Hilton would make that so nice that you would want to put other uh, stores and things in the mall. So there, there's, there's a lot of progress that can be made. I, I'd, I'd like to find out from whatever council members are so adamantly opposed to it, I'd like to find out what the fight is about it. I, I know it's a chunk of change, but if we don't move forward, we go backwards. And I, the last store I built, I'm 68 years old. I did it a couple of years ago. But if it was time, it was 10 years, and I, we either move forward in our business or we move back. And we're under a lot of pressure from internet and things like that, and we're still in there fighting. And I would like, I'm interested in keeping the downtown fighting and keeping going. It's a, good, it's a good project. It's a company that has a heck of a great reputation. You know, and I don't come out to these things. I, I like hiding in the back room. So <laughs> if I'm coming to this, I'm, I mean business because I think the people in downtown mean business. They want an economy, and I don't want to give it all to Champagne. I came here to do business, and I think we need to do business here. So, and then I'll be back next week. <laughs> Thank you very much for investing $3 million in Urbana. <laughs> we appreciate it. I hate the taxes. <laughs> but may, maybe... Um, Maybe people like to try on shoes instead of buying them online, <laughs> which is good for your business. You have a great business. Any questions for Mr. Martins? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wants to address the Urbana City Council? Okay. Oh, I have, um, yeah, I have another one here. Uh, Bishop King James and Reverend Dr. Evelyn B. Underwood do not wish to address the members, but ask that their position be entered into the record as continually concerned about the Dr. Ellis subdivision sewer <coughs> problem. Okay. Um, we have fire prevention, fire prevention and education presentation. Right, um, <clears throat> I appreciate that. <laughs> Mama told me I didn't have long to talk. Uh, Phyllis, she said, keep it brief, so don't listen slow, because I'll be talking fast. Um, all right, so uh, basically we're here to present, um, uh, to talk about the prevention education division of the department. Uh, I'm Fire Marshal Phil Edwards. Fire Prevention Officer Jeremy Levy. And uh, we got a little slideshow. Sort of for your visual pleasure, but to keep us online and to keep us on time. All right, Mama, just help me out. All right, basically our mission uh, at the Prevention and Education our, Division um, is to save life and property through prevention and education. Now, you're looking at two faces right here speaking to you, but you, we're representing 56 because the boots are on the ground. Every program that we talk about today, while we're the ones talking about the programs, it are the, it's the firefighters that are actually riding on the engines and the truck that actually make these programs work. So you, you'll see a few numbers tonight uh, compiled by uh, Captain uh, Huska. I appreciate the, all the work that he did on this. But uh, I just you know, wanted to throw it out there that they are the ones that really make this happen. Uh, when it comes to saving life and property, um, there are three phases, before the fire, during the fire, and after the fire. Mine and his position is before the fire starts to try to keep it from starting through education and prevention. And then when it comes to investigation, Jeremy runs the investigation program, which you'll hear about a little bit later on. And then when it comes to putting the fire out, you have the firefighters on the engine, but they're involved in all three phases. When we do prevention education, they're out there. When it comes to putting the fire out, they're out there. When it comes to investigation, we have an investigation team. So. Uh, 
Real quick, uh, the things we'll talk about real quick will be staffing and duties of the prevention education team, what we do in prevention, what we do in education, as well as community involvement. Uh, staffing duties as the fire marshal, uh, I'm a, I actually oversee the inspection program for the city. Uh, I do fire safety uh, education events. Uh, some of your kids, uh, they, may, they may have come over to Lincoln Square and seen some of the things that we do. Uh, I'm part of the problem properties team as well as uh, involved with community involvement. Um, fire prevention officer Levy, he does the inspection program for the U of I and basically what I do for the city, he does for the University of Illinois. Uh, he heads up our fire investigation team for the city and he also does fire education for the U of I and new construction with the U of I. He works with them. And that beautiful face that you see right there, that's Clay Bear. He is the fire prevention, uh, he's the fire inspector. Uh, he's part-time while Jeremy and I are full-time. He comes in 20 hours a week. And uh, he's primar his primary position is to do the initial inspection on fire prevention permit uh, um, businesses. As far as what we do for the city, um, our inspection program, we, do, we have the fire prevention permit program and there are 504 uh, businesses that have a fire prevention permit. And fire investigator, fire inspector, Clay Bear, he actually does 424 of those initial inspections of the 504. The other 80, they're done by myself because as I'm doing the liquor license inspections, I also do the fire prevention permit inspection uh, on those. So uh, that's where the 504 comes from. The 424 done by Clay, and the 80 by myself, as well as all of the follow-up inspections, I do all of those um, <clears throat> as far as the follow-up if we don't get compliance. And then we have the commercial inspections. The commercial and multifamily in inspections, again, the firefighters that are on the engines, uh, they're actually out when there's, not, when there's not a fire burning, then they are out busy. If they're not training, they're doing inspections, they're doing a lot of different things to make sure these programs are running. We also are review emergency action plan for different businesses upon their request. If they want to know what they should do in an emergency uh, for their specific business, then we'll go over their plan with them and uh, give instruction. We also do supervised fire drills. And if you look at that picture right there, um, those are actually, um, that's a fire drill and you have a bunch of adults that are sort of looking, some are looking down at their phone and doing anything but leaving. But what we'd like to see when we get involved, when we do a supervised drill, we like to see something more like this where people are leaving out in a single file. Now the fact that there are, there are students and younger people that are going out in a single file has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that they could do a fire drill. Anyone could do a good fire drill, but uh, that was just coincidence. Uh, we supervise 10 fire drills uh, through our businesses, but we're willing to do it for anyone upon request. And then we have extinguisher training in the city. Any business or occupation that, uh, that, has a, that wants an extinguisher training we're willing to come to their location. We have an actual fire simulator where we can actually uh, let them put out the actual fl flame instead of it being something that's just uh, makeshift. Uh, when it comes to our residential program, now this is where I'm gonna really hang my, hang my hat on this hook. Uh, the smoke detector program, the home fire life safety program. What you're looking at right now, these are clips of a, of a newspaper from 1976. That's when the program was actually uh, started by Chief Troger, and he had this vision, now this is back in 1976, that many people were dying in fires because they were not being awake, they weren't being awake in the time. So he was thinking, how can we get this, how can we address this problem? So by going door to door and making sure that people know about fire safety and having smoke detectors, we can save more lives. So in 1976, the reason I want that date to really resonate with you is because I just went to a program, Jeremy and myself, we went to a conference in Peoria. And in that conference, you have cities talking about, hey, it's great. We have 50 detectors and we're going to go out and we're going to give them out to different, to residents. And we're like, oh, that's, that's good. <laughs> we're proud of you. And we even had one organization offer us 50 detectors so that we could go door to door. And I said, you know, really, you could give this to another department because since 76, we've been doing this. And um, <clears throat> our smoke detector program, what I'll talk about is what happens in a typical year as opposed to what happened to last year in 2016. Uh, on an annual basis, 
annual basis. Basically, we go to 6,300 homes. Uh, last year, it was up to 77, 78. And of those 63 homes, typically we're getting about 1,210 of those. So we knock on every door that we can, and if we don't get an answer, then we leave a door tag to have people call us back. And they can call us at their leisure, at their convenience, and we'll come back out and put a smoke detector up for them. Uh, typically, we check uh, two, 2,050 detectors on an annual basis. Uh, and these numbers can fluctuate depending on what things like weather, uh, whether it's uh, raining, we don't want to track mud in people's homes. Uh, if it's too hot, we want everyone to be safe. We, we, we may not go out. And if there's a home Illini football game, we may not get in as many, uh, we may not get in as many houses, especially if they're winning. Uh, but basically, we install a, an average of 215 detectors, uh, I mean 215 batteries, and an average of uh, 135 detectors. And last year, we also checked sm uh, fire extinguishers. That's not something that we offer as far as giving extinguishers, but if someone has one, we will look at it and see if it's within the green area to know if it's good or not and give them advice on whether or not it's time to replace it. Um, since 1998, uh, Captain Husker really did his research. We have knocked on 119,000 doors. That's a lot of doors. Uh, not all of them have door knockers, so we have to actually use our knockers so it could be a little uh, challenging. Uh, we rented over 24,000 homes, 38,000 detectors have been checked, 4,078 batteries uh, installed, and 2,500 detectors actually installed. So what we do is we don't just knock on your door and say, hey, have, have you checked your smoke detector? We actually provide one if they don't have one. And one of the interesting things is when the firefighters are going down the street, going door to door, you start hearing detectors going off because people see us coming. So it's like it's putting in their mind, hey, this is, what, you know, this is what we want you to do. Check your smoke detectors. Even if you don't let us do it, we want you to think about it because uh, basically I tell people, your smoke detectors, your nose while you're asleep. All right? <clears throat> now, as far as our school-based programs, we have the Risk Watch program, which is it's basically unintentional injury prevention program, and it has eight different disciplines in it. We talk about choking, gun safety, pedestrian safety, uh, there are eight different topics, and the two that the fire department cover uh, are fire safety and natural disasters. Uh, we team up with uh, other divisions. We team up with the police department, uh, as well as uh, Red Cross and the school district, and together we all have different topics that, we're, uh, that we will discuss, and uh, fire safety and natural disasters are the ones that the fire department actually cover. We get inside the schools twice a year. Uh, Everywhere from pre-K up to fifth grade, we're in twice a year, and we're talking about fire safety, natural disaster safety, and um, we also get out there again and we do the school, the fire drills for the schools. And um, what we've done is we made a friendly competition out of it between the principals. You never realize how competitive principals are until you tell them they can win a prize. Uh, but basically, what we do is we time the school drill, the school evacuation, and whoever evacuate quickest. They get a certificate, and first, second, and third place get a certificate, and the first place they also get a nice little trophy. And the, the schools, while they think they're just, you know, trying to win a trophy, uh, they're actually taking care of our children, making sure that they get out in a timely manner. Uh, last year, uh, well, in 2015, uh, the winning school got out in two minutes and five seconds. We'll be happy with four minutes. They got them two minutes and five seconds, and uh, the record overall is one minute, 56 seconds. Uh, and then for fire prevention week, we go over to fire, uh, we go over to Lincoln Square every year, and the schools come through, one, uh, they come through, you know, funnel through, and we have different stations they go through. Stop, drop, and roll, crawl, low, and smoke. Uh, we talk about smoke detector safety, all of these things with the children. And one of the most rewarding things that ever happened is, uh, there was a teacher that called from Lille School, and I wasn't able to answer the phone at the time, but she left a message saying that there was a very significant fire um, uh, incident with two of their children. And because they got too close to a grill, they actually caught fire. And, but everyone that responded, the firefighters and all the first responders, she said, told her that it would have been a lot worse and they may not have survived if they hadn't remembered to stop, drop, and roll as they had just learned at Fire Prevention Week in Lincoln Square a few weeks prior. So um, <clears throat> the fact that I was not able to answer that call 
you know, I wish I could have talked to her, but under the same respect, whenever I do presentations, I actually play that call to let people know that this is why we do what we do. All right, and then out of all the things that I just talked about, this is the glue that ties it all together, our community involvement. Uh, we want people to be fire safe. We want people to let us check their smoke detectors. But if they don't know us, they're not as likely to comply with what we say. So we believe that through relationship with the community, if we say check your smoke detector, they're not just hearing it from a person in authority and an authority figure. They're hearing it from a friend. They're hearing it from someone from the community. So when they get out and they go to Walmart, they see us shopping, they see us cutting our grass. When they have a community event, the fire department is there. Um, the firefighters, they will bring an engine by, let the kids see the fire engine. By doing these things, then when we say, hey, you know, have you checked your smoke detector, there's a much better chance of getting compliance. And uh, when we talk to the businesses, hey, you know, you shouldn't block that exit, there's a better chance of getting compliance. Never mind the fact that you could get a fine, that's not what it's about, we're about compliance. And we think that getting out in the community and being involved, it gives us a better chance of getting compliance and uh, what our ultimate mission is. And uh, that's for the city side. And next I'm going to let um, Jeremy speak for the U of I side. Awesome. Thank you guys for having us here tonight. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do with the fire department and the university. Um, I've been with the city now for five years and solely working with the university the entire time. My office is at the campus fire station, station number four. Um, I'm located on campus, which is good for me because that's where I spend the majority of my day. Um, as you can see from some of the stats up here, I go through a, about 100 buildings a year on the university. Um, we're checking for code compliance and safety issues inside these buildings. Um, I work with the private certified housing facilities. You know that the university has a huge Greek system here, and we have uh, 22 private certified housing facilities located in the city of Urbana. Um, I work with them on an annual basis twice a year. Um, you can see the U of, U of I walkthroughs. Those are done by all the staff here, all the firefighters. They go through each building annually, multiple times, try and get through as many buildings as possible, just so they're familiar with these buildings when they have to resp respond there for a fire alarm or uh, any kind of uh, situation that could be present. Um, they're always updating pre-plans with the university. That number actually should be 60, not 20. Um, on home football games, um, we're doing tent inspections. So we're out there going through the tents, making sure that it's safe for the community to be inside the tents. They're not parking the uh, smoker or the grill too close to the tent or running the generator too close to the tent, things like that that could be a problem. Make sure they have enough exits in the tent for the amount of people they have in there. Hopefully the uh, football team gets a little better so the tents are a little more packed over the next coming years. <laughs> Um, we also do fire drills with the university, uh, University High School, um, which is located over there on West Springfield, not to mention uh, all the dorms. The dorms are required to do a fire drill each semester within the first three weeks of the semester. I'm on hand for those to observe and note anything that uh, maybe needs worked on, which they can pass on to their RAs and their RDs and, and work with the students there at that specific uh, dormitory. And you do that pretty early in the morning, right? Uh, the dormitories, uh, usually in the evening. The fire drills with the Greek facilities, we, we try and do that in, uh, between 5 and 6 a.m. We like to wake them up and really get a uh, true reaction of how they would do if the, uh, they had an emergency in their house. So uh, always very entertaining at that time of the morning. Uh, also, we do fire extinguisher classes. I have classes throughout the year, fire safety presentations. I do a lecture with... Uh, a chemistry and material science class every semester. I uh, come in for one night to do that. And in fact, I have to do that next Monday night, as a matter of fact. Um, do a lot of presentations with the private certified houses that I talked about. They'll invite me to come in and give a fire safety talk. And uh, that's always good to get that one-on-one -on -one interaction with 30, 40 students at a time. Uh, Move-in day. Some of you guys have uh, participated in the move-in day event before where we meet some of the incoming freshmen as they come in on move-in day, uh, hand them out some fire safety materials and talk to them about fire safety. Um, and then last year we started a move-in night event where we're also encouraging them to come to that event and learn a little bit about fire safety and learn a little bit about what we do here on the campus and, and things like that. 
Uh, we up update Knoxbox cards each year. Like I said, I am the primary liaison between the university and the fire department. Um, I work with the university on construction projects throughout campus, go to all the pre-construction meetings for all their projects they have going on. There's a list of some of the projects that have gone on recently or are going on right now. Obviously, the state farm renovation was a big one. So uh, we uh, made it through there. There was only two small incidents with uh, injuries there, which is very good. Um, but some things we addressed and, and moved forward from that. So we didn't have uh, any more injuries going forward. And as Phil talked about after the fire, um, I serve as the chief fire investigator for the city. We have 11 fire, fire investigators on the department. Um, they cover different shifts, obviously. Uh, Phil and I are the two that work the 40-hour uh, week. So uh, I'm responsible for their management, their training, um, all their supervision. Um, it takes 120 hours to become a fire investigator, so it's a lot of time. Um, last year, we had five investigations on the campus um, that I performed, and then we also had a, another 48 here in the city that um, myself or one of the other uh, fire investigators was a part of completing those. Um, if I don't go to that fire investigation, I'm at least going to go through the report and, and make sure everything's uh, up to snuff on the report. And then not only after you spend that 120 hours to become a fire investigator, it takes another 25 to 40 hours a year to keep your certification up. So it's a huge time investment with training and um, something that you know our people really do a great job of keeping up with. Training is a big priority for us. So I'll thank mm -hmm. you for your time and turn it over to you guys if you have any questions you would like to ask uh, either one of us or Chief Nightlinger who's in the room. Any questions? Yes, Eric. So the prevention and education is really impressive. And I mean, it's been going on for a while. Uh, can we actually see a downward trend in fires over the years that's a result of that? You know, it's very interesting you asked that question because um, when uh, Captain Husker created these numbers for me, he gave me a list of things I was supposed to say. And um, I can't use the big words like he could. Um, but since 1998, uh, Ur Urbana has only suffered five related fire fatalities. And um, while, it's, while it's important to remember that correlation does not necessarily mean causation, Recent research suggests that minor adjustments to situation awareness can provide significant safety benefits. Those are his words. I am not that smart to use the word causation. I don't even know what it means. But I will say that um, I don't have all the specific numbers, but I do see that in Urbana. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot fewer fires um, than uh, a lot of other cities, of some of our surrounding cities. Uh, sometimes, um, uh, our guys ask, why aren't we in the news a little bit more? You know, we like, you know, firefighters, we like to be in the news. And, you know, while uh, that's, that's not bad to be in the news, to have good news, unfortunately, they don't report fires that aren't happening. Mm -hmm. So if we're not in the news quite as much, it's not necessarily a bad thing because they're not going to call and say, hey, a fire didn't happen today, so WCIA, they weren't necessarily interested in that. So, uh, but I will say that there is a downward trend uh, in Urbana. And I will say over the last four years, I know of two fires for sure where we've had uh, residents who got out of the building who said that because we came by earlier that year and installed a smoke detector is the reason they got out of the building mm -hmm. while it was on fire. So two documented cases of that for sure. So I this, know. this isn't a question, but this is just bragging. One of the proudest things on my wall is a plaque that the fire department gave me for putting out a fire that I detected when I was bicycling past wow jumped off and uh, put it out with a uh, garden hose from next door oh okay I was gonna ask do you just ride around with garden hose on your bike or <laughs> no, no I'm no. glad you explained that that's <laughs> it, it, I did something I could never do again I actually jumped over a hedge dragging that hose. <laughs> <laughs> I had a uh, two groups of third graders here last week and I asked them, uh, you know, what do you do in an emergency? They all knew dial 911, and they all knew stop, drop, and roll, and stay down because you don't want to have to breathe the smoke. So you do a good job training. Bill? 
Um, yeah, I, I had the opportunity to take the um, fire extinguisher training from Jeremy last year at uh, VetMed, and I would recommend it for everybody. It uh, gives you kind of a realistic feel for what the fi fire feels like because it's pretty substantial. It, it puts out some heat, that mm -hmm. big thing, whatever you call it. Um, and um, I, I don't remember all of it, but I do remember the first thing you're supposed to do is tell somebody specifically to call 911 because chances are you might not get it out or might not get it to stay out once you use it. So Absolutely. Um, all that stuff is good to know and um, think, I hope, yeah, hope I never have to use it, but at least uh, I feel more confident using it if I need to. I was going to mention that he was in my class, but I didn't want to put him on the spot. <laughs> so. You was hoping he, he didn't forget something you taught him. Well, <laughs> when you ask someone to call 911, you m want to make sure when you tell them, you go call 911. And if they ask you what's the number, you find someone else to call 911. <laughs> um, but uh, seriously, as far as, um, you know, our goal, um, you know, I like to sort of principalize things, but our goal is to have everyone experience the only fire that doesn't burn which is a prevented fire. And we like to believe that now the things that we're doing, while we can't prove it, we like to believe that uh, we're doing all we can and fires are decreasing in number because of our efforts. So uh, we appreciate you guys' support in doing this. Mike. I have a question. Oh, Aaron, and then Mike. Go ahead, Aaron. Thanks. <coughs> so thank you guys for the presentation and for all the work that you do. I was hoping to see if there was a if you do anything in relationship to carbon monoxide detectors. He was asking about carbon monoxide detectors? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, one of the things we do with carbon monoxide detectors, while we don't provide them, um, we do actually tell people to test their batteries. But what we don't do is actually enter, we don't test the sensors in them because the carbon monoxide detector, the way that they work is they're cumulative. So they get hit with a little bit of carbon monoxide. It doesn't put it into a lawn, but it holds on to that. So after so many times getting hit, it goes into alarm. Well, if, you, if we go in and monitor and see that there's not a problem, we look at the detector and realize, oh, it's about seven years old. Over seven years, it's built up enough to go into alarm. So if we were to test it every month, then what we're doing is we're actually shortening the life of a carbon monoxide detector. So uh, we will actually test the battery. And while he brought that up, it's a good topic is that we all, we would like to see people have single detection de devices. Uh, some people would like, you know, the smoke and carbon monoxide detector, the combinations. But we actually have a case where uh, it was a dual detecting device and it was going off because of carbon monoxide, but the residents didn't realize that. They thought the smoke detector was malfunctioning. They took the battery out, laid back down. We ended up transporting five people to the hospital because of carbon monoxide uh, poisoning. So what we suggest is that you have your carbon monoxide, you have your smoke detector, have them clearly marked so you know which hazard is happening uh, at that time. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, yeah, Mike. Sorry. Yeah, I don't have any questions. Just a couple of comments. As a, as a business owner here in town, I've just, I just want to say I've really appreciated uh, my interaction uh, with the department. It's been on multiple occasions, uh, mostly through inspections. Um, but I, just, uh, I really appreciate the, the tact that you take. Uh, like you say, it's not about being punitive, it's about being safe. So you point things out of my business, uh, we get them fixed, we get them corrected. Uh, it becomes a little more top of mind uh, because of that. And uh, also at the, uh, at the concessions, at the, uh, at the stadium, the tailgates and that kind of thing, you guys are always great to work with too. And I think it's a, a great public service and it uh, really helps to keep everybody safe. And I do want to mention one other thing. Um, <laughs> So uh, twice now, we've been at home, and you've come by to do the home inspection. And one of the things that you left out that I think is super important, uh, the first time um, the young man asked my daughter, my, she was probably eight at that time, she, he, uh, he said, so where do you meet if there's a fire? Where, what's the plan? And we all looked at him like, hell, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it got us to thinking about it, and now she knows exactly where to go out mm -hmm. the house. You know, she doesn't need to wait for mom and dad. She needs to, she needs to, you know, yell fire or, you know, maybe not try to help us necessarily, but to get out and mm -hmm. to go to the post light in the front yard. <laughs> so she awesome. knows that now, and it's something we frankly never thought of. So I, I really do appreciate all you do. Thank well, you. I, I started laughing because I thought you were going to talk about being the one of the first people to ride on the brand new fire engine when we got into 251. 
She, yeah, we bought that on an auction at the school at Thomas <laughs> Paine. She was one of the very first riders. Uh, she got a ride home in that, and it was pretty cool. As did you. Don't, you, don't leave yourself out. You. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. For your presentation and for what you do every day. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I, I didn't hear the, the dinger going up, but I felt her eyebrow going up, so to let me know to go. Thanks. Okay, I don't think we have any unfinished business that we're going to deal with tonight. Uh, we'll go to reports of standing committees. Uh, Dennis Roberts, Committee of the Whole. Right, we have two items that come from to the City Council from the Committee of the Whole meeting last week. Uh, the first one is resolution number 2017-03-018. R, a resolution approving an easement agreement with the Board of Trustees of the University of Illinois concerning Oregon Street between Gregory Street and Lincoln Avenue. And for the committee, I move approval. Second. Motion by Roberts, seconded by Smythe. Any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Ammons? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Madigan? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. That motion carries. All right. The next item is uh, ordinance number 2017-03-016, an ordinance amending Urbana City Code Chapter 20 concerning the use of right-of-way. This has to do with the authority to enter into the exec into an execute ex and execute a right of way use license and this item clarifies the mayor's authority to do such for the committee I move approval second motion by Robert seconded by Smythe any discussion would the clerk please call the roll mr. Ammons yes mr. Brown yes mr. Jacobson yes mr. Madigan yes miss Marlin yes mr. Roberts yes mr. Smythe yes that motion carries Okay, reports of special committees. Dennis Roberts. Yeah, I'd just like to mention that the Urbana Sister City Committee is um, uh, involved right now in the, uh, cr the uh, judging of uh, community art that's been submitted um, for the uh, Young Artists um, and Authors Showcase Competition. This is a, this is a, uh, a national competition by Sister Cities International. And one of the preliminary outreaches of our community uh, project is um, working with uh, the NAACP mentoring program at the high school and junior high school called ACT SO. And uh, it, this is an after, uh, an after hours program for young adults in the African American community that uh, trains them to do professional presentations and prepare uh, um, artwork. Uh, poetry, uh, do some, um, present speeches, and other creative activities. And we're very pleased to, uh, myself and uh, Meg Miller acted as judges for the visual arts, which also allowed us then to um, make a selection for uh, an award that our Sister Cities program is going to be um, awarding as well in the award ceremony in May. And um, we are also working with the uh, Tionville Sister City um, par partnership in asking them to also submit work to our project. And we have received a $250 grant from the Urbana um, Public Arts Commission to make an exhibit, uh, international arts exhibit, later in the year. So I just wanted to be, I'll let you know that we're very proud to be involved in that. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, re Reports of officers. Any reports of officers? Bill Gray, Public Works Director. Last week we uh, received and opened bids for the street lighting project, of which you just approved the easement for the controller. Uh, this is for Oregon, Gregory, and Illinois Street west of Lincoln. And we had one bidder, but the bid came in. Uh, $100,000 under our engineer's estimates in our budget, so that's really good news. And Champagne Signal and Lighting plans to start the project right away, and they're also a subcontractor to the general contractor on the Green Street MCOR project. So the two projects being right next to each other really helped out as they're 
uh, costs related to this project were lower because of the synergy of these two projects. So um, that was good news. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Bill. Um, yeah, I know. Um, if there's if there's going to be somebody coming to talk about the hotel next week, um, I was wondering if we could get a copy of the SB Friedman report that was done last fall, the um, marketing study. Pardon me. We have newer things, I think. We'll give you the latest ones. Lily, Libby, do you want to talk about that? We, we do have a lot of new information. Um, just today, we got an updated report from Brenda Paytech, who's a marketing consultant. Um, I know council members have seen the materials that we had in October, so there's a lot of additional materials. Um, the plan is to have these materials in two forms, some as proprietary and some will be, majority will be in the council packet. And um, a lot of attachments, special studies, some of these you've seen in earlier versions previously. So. Um, but we can we will certainly certainly send you those reports. Some will come with an advisory on confidentiality. So that would include the SB Friedman report that was done in September and October. Um, yes, we can send that again. I think I don't know what that's marked, but and okay. that would I think be we paid like twelve thousand dollars for it, so it's probably a pretty good report. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, under new business, I have two appointments to take effect April 15th. Um, Chief Connolly is retiring, as you know, on April 14th. So I would recommend uh, appointing Sylvia Morgan, who's currently the Deputy Chief as Interim Police Chief, and Bryant Serafin, uh, who is currently a Lieutenant as Interim Deputy Chief. So moved. I'll second. I'll second. Okay, motion by Smythe, seconded by Roberts. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? That motion carries. It was unanimous. I just it. want them to know that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, there being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>